Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In part three of his treatise on the basis of morality, Arthur Schopenhauer is going to finish up chapter 17, which is all about the virtue of justice with a very interesting and well worked out discussion of the morality of lying. And Schopenhauer is opposing his own position to that of Immanuel Kant in particular. Uh, saying, for example, that the unconditional and boundless abhorrence of lies which Kant evinces on every occasion is due either to affectation or prejudice. In the chapter of his doctrine of virtue that deals with lies, he inveighs against them with every defamatory epithet, but does not quote a single adequate reason for their condemnation, which, after all, would have been more effective. Declamation is easier than demonstration and moralizing easier than being sincere. And he says, Kant could have taken a different path. He would have done better to launch his special indignation against the malicious joy at the misfortune of others. This not lying is really the devilish vice. And then he talks about the principle of knightly honor, which he thinks is kind of lurking behind the scenes for Kant. The reproach of being a liar is regarded as extremely grave and really to be washed out with the accuser's blood. This is not because the lie is wrong, for then the accusation of wrongdoing through violence would inevitably just as gravely offensive. We know this is not the case. On the contrary, it is because according to the principle of knightly honor, right is really based on might. And so, you know, on the one hand, we've got Kant, whose views on lying are not as good as they ought to be. On the other hand, we have, you know, knightly honor, which is all just, you know, tomfoolery and really uh, needs to be gotten past. But not all lying is okay. What's wrong with lying? Well, if we back up a little bit, he begins by talking about cunning. And he says that... Um, there's two ways of doing wrong, those of violence to other people and those of cunning. So through violence, I can kill another person, I can rob him, I can force him to obey me. And he says, by cunning, I can do all these things as well. And the lie is a means to do that. As a matter of fact, the means you could say par excellence. Um, I confront, he says, his intellect with false motives in consequence of which he must do what he otherwise would not. This is affected by means of the lie whose ob objectionable nature rests on this alone and therefore sticks to it only insofar as it is an instrument of cunning that is of compulsion by means of motivation. So with a lie, you can kill somebody, you can force them, you can rob them, you can do a lot more because you're putting wrong ideas into their head. You're supplying them with falsehoods instead of truth in things that, you know, could be very trivial or could be momentous. So if you think about how advertising works by getting you to think that you should buy a product that you don't really need, uh, they're, they're engaging in cunning. They're lying to you. And if you waste a lot of money, here's a great example. Think about the advertisements that you see for online betting or for cryptocurrency. You better get in on it or else you're going to lose out. 
Well, these are effectively lies, right? And these are putting ideas into people's heads, and then they act on those ideas. They make decisions based on those ideas. They don't do other things based on those ideas, like keep their money in the bank and not spend it on frivolous things, right? So you're confronting the intellect of another person with false motives. Is this by itself automatically wrong or bad? Well, this is where we have to ask, what is the motive lying behind a lie? Every lie works on the motives of other people, but every lie emerges from a motive that I, the liar, have for telling the lie. And typically, these are going to be unjust. I want to get some sort of advantage over somebody else. I don't want them to compete with me for a job, for a mate, for a place to live. So I tell them lies about these things or I lie to them about their own capacities or whether there is a job. Well, that would be unjust. And um, Schopenhauer actually goes through a number of different uh, clarifications here that, that are quite important. So he says, uh, this intention to compel other people by means of motivation underlies even the merely bombastic lie. What is a bombastic lie? It, it's a lie where you're saying something that like makes you look better or uh, gets you into a group or something like that. And it's not really doing much of anything, but there is a motivation. What is the motivation? To raise yourself in the eyes of others, probably not just higher than you deserve, but at the expense of others. The person who hears somebody else telling their travel story and then they make up some other travel story that sounds even cooler, right? Or you're talking about celebrities and you make up a lie about a celebrity so that you get listened to. That would be a bombastic lie. And, you know, it might not be in some sense as bad as a lie that leads to somebody killing another person or taking poison, but you know, it's, it's still a lie and it's not for a good purpose, right? It's raising oneself in others' eyes. Um, he goes on with something much more serious and he talks about lying promises and contracts. You know, Kant brought this up in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals in this very context saying, if I know I need money, and I don't think I'll ever be able to pay it back, is it okay for me to go to somebody and ask them for a loan, making a lying promise that I will pay them back? And Kant, of course, says, no, you can't do that because you can't universalize this. Truth and falsity itself would fall apart. Schopenhauer says, you can't do that. Well, you can do that, but you are doing wrong, doing injustice by doing that. Your motivation is wrong. And people see that and view it as a kind of treachery, right? The height of fraud. And what is going on when you do this? You want the other person to do something that you're agreeing to because a contract goes both ways, right? You don't want to do your part. So you get them to do their part first, and then you take off. Or you say, oh, I didn't really mean it, or something along those lines. People do this all the time, right? People make lying promises in part because they want to get something in the present, and they don't want ultimately to deliver on what it is that they have committed to. So that, that's an unjust motive for lying. So it seems like lies are generally unjust, right? Well, yes, but Schopenhauer thinks that there are in fact many cases where we not only can lie, it's morally permissible for us to lie, but we should lie. It's justice, it's the right thing to do. And so he uses as an example of this um, self-defense. And he says that if you're allowed to use violence against another to protect yourself or perhaps to protect other vulnerable others that the aggressor is attacking, and you can justly use self-defense to do that, then you can also do that with cunning. He says, if I can repel force by force without doing wrong and thus with right, so I can repel force with cunning if I lack the power, or if it appears more convenient to me. It's okay 
to lie against an aggressor, even if you could resist them, even if you have the strength, the arms. And he says, in cases where I have a right to use force, I have a right to tell lies. For example, I can resort to lies against robbers and ruffians of every sort who I can accordingly entice into a trap through cunning, right? Or you could lie to him and say, I've got a gun. I'm going to shoot you if you don't get out of my house, my apartment, my trailer, whatever it happens to be, right? Oh, I've got, I've got a big dog that I'm going to release and he'll bite your face off. <laughs> you don't have a dog at all. Maybe you have a hamster instead, right? Uh, who's not going to do anything. Schopenhauer would say that's perfectly fine to lie in those sorts of cases. He also says, a promise extorted by force is not binding. A robber comes in and says, you have to count to a thousand uh, after I leave. And you say, sure, sure, I'll do that. You don't have to count to a thousand. You don't have to count to anything. You've made a promise under duress. And so he says, the right to tell lies goes even further. So this is very interesting. It occurs in the case of every, and this is an important qualifier, wholly unauthorized question concerning my personal or my business affairs, which is prompted by curiosity. If somebody wants to know things, they don't have a right to that information. And they're actually, in many cases, transgressing by asking for it. This is, a, I think, a great point. You, we're often made to feel as if we have to give our information to other people. Schopenhauer is saying, you don't know, you don't actually owe most people anything. You don't have to give them that information at all. It's up to you. He says, uh, if I should be exposed to danger by answering it, or even by putting off and incurring suspicion by saying, I won't tell you, the lie becomes the legitimate means of defense against unauthorized inquisitiveness. And now here's the key thing. Whose motive, he says, is hardly ever benevolent. It could be that the person who's asking you is just trying to make conversation. They're being nice. Maybe they actually want to invite you to a party. They're asking you about uh, what's your schedule usually like. Those could be benevolent, but you don't know. Because according to Schopenhauer, most people are primarily driven by immoral, anti-moral motives rather than those of morality. So responding to unauthorized questions, you have the right to say, I'm not going to tell you a damn thing, or you don't get to ask that sort of thing, or that's none of your business. He says, I have the right to oppose the implied bad will of others. Uh, so as a preventative mother, measure, I can um, you repel them as I would some sort of invader. And he says, without doing wrong, I can cunningly oppose in advance. It doesn't even have to be like on the spot, in advance. Even the merely presumed harm through cunning, I don't have to give an account to anyone who unwarrantedly pries into my private affairs I don't even have to say that there's a secret involved, right? Because by answering, I wish to keep this a secret, I'm, I'm signaling that there's something that I'm concealing from them. And he says, I don't have to show him the place where there's a secret that's dangerous to me and possibly advantageous to him, but which in any case puts me into his power. On the contrary, I'm entitled to put him off with a lie at his risk. The lie is in this case, confronting the intellect of another with false motives, right? And so, you know, they ask me, what's your schedule like? I'm having a party. And you're like, well, I'm very busy, even though you're not. You'd rather just stay at home and watch TV or something like that. Uh, they don't invite you. And maybe, you know, you would have been a, a good speaker there or a conversationalist or whatever. They lose out on it. Too bad. They didn't have any good reason to be expecting you to tell them the truth. And he's got this wonderful discussion here about the English. He says, the English consider the reproach of telling lies the gravest insult, right? So they think telling lies is very bad and therefore actually tell fewer lies than do other nations. Okay, that makes sense. Accordingly, they regard as a piece of impertinence and ill-breeding all unauthorized questions concerning other people's affair 
This is denoted by the expression to ask questions. And he says, you know, ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Because if you ask me questions and you don't have a right to that information, I get to tell you lies, right? So be fair warned. And he also talks about, besides self-defense, other situations where lies would be warranted or even a duty. And he brings up doctors. This is something I should point out that has been changing in biomedical ethics over the last maybe 50 years or so. But in the past, um, the interpretation of the Hippocratic Oath that you know, says that you shouldn't harm patients, it's you know, a little bit more complicated than that when you actually look at the real oath itself. Um, giving information could be viewed as harmful to a person because you're upsetting them about something that they really can't do much about. So think about if you determine that a patient has cancer and there's no way of saving them. Now, actually, I would say, well, you should inform them so they can get their affairs in order. But the, the tendency of the past is to say, oh, no, no, don't upset them. Just let them die and uh, let them think that they're you know, just not doing well, but perhaps could get better. And then they'll die and it's, it's all over. They didn't suffer quite as much. So that's one possibility. He also talks about magnanimous lies. And here what he seems to have in mind is lying about whether you did something to take on the punishment that another person would have incurred because they actually did it. So covering for somebody else and taking on that punishment would be an example, right? Um, he brings up uh, Campanella saying um, it's fine to tell lies when they result in so much good. He also does bring up the theory of the white lie and he calls it the wretched patch on the garment of miserable morality. So he's not countenancing every sort of white lie as we call them, lies with good consequences, lies to save other people's feelings or things like that. He does seem to think that there has to be some good reason to lie. But Schopenhauer is saying that not all lies are unjust. As a matter of fact, you might have a duty in some cases to tell lies, whether to protect yourself or to protect others from injustice, from harm and, and violence and things like that. So lying is kind of a complicated issue for Schopenhauer, significantly more complicated than it is for the people who he's criticizing, like Immanuel Kant.